Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, good to see everybody in again, and uh, you know, when you come into these tapings, you've got to be patient, because sometimes everything doesn't roll as, roll as smooth as we'd like, but uh, for those that come in, we always have an enjoyable afternoon, and uh, the goodies back there are right in line with the celebration of the holidays, so we've been having a good time this afternoon. Okay, for those of you joining us on television, we're just an informal Bible study, and uh, we are not supported by any one group. And consequently, we appreciate your letters and your prayers as well as your gifts. Now, I normally do not promote the products. I, I just let it be known at the end of the program, I trust. But we do have one that I'm putting out a little uh, more emphasis for selfish reasons. It's a question and answer book of about 90 most often asked questions. And the answers are taken from our uh, written material. And Paul Hartley out in Indiana did all the footwork. But anyway, hopefully it'll uh, take a little of the load off of me having to answer so many questions through the mail. So if you've got a lot of questions, uh, this little book is 11 bucks. We aren't trying to make anything on it. And uh, you'd like a copy, you just call the 800 number or drop us a note and the girls will get one out to you. And uh, it's really filling a niche and a lot of people are enjoying it. So remember that. If you've got a lot of questions, why uh, just uh, order the question and answer book and then you can save me a lot of time Sunday afternoons and so forth answering questions. Because I, I do feel that when questions come in, I like to answer them myself and uh, I do it in handwriting so that people will know that some strange staff person isn't doing it. So that's the reason that I answer uh, the way I do. Okay, now I guess, uh, are they ready to get another shot? And my daughter and her husband are here with us today, and uh, I don't think they got a very good shot the first time around. So anyway, Jerry and uh, my daughter, Laura, who many of you out in television now talk to on the phone, and uh, I don't think she realized when she came in to do what she's doing that it would be so much fun that uh, she can talk to people from one end of this country to the other, and uh, she'll come in, she says, Daddy, have you ever talked to so-and-so? Yeah, well, they're a neat person. <laughs> so anyhow, it is. It, it's, it's a thrill to, uh, to talk to so many people. So anyhow, we're glad to have Jerry, my son-in-law, and I'm as proud of him as I could be of my own. And uh, my daughter, Laura, the girls left. I guess they had some shopping to do. Otherwise, Laura's daughter, Tara, was with her. But... Uh, Anyhow, we're, we're just tickled to death to have them with us. All right, were you going to get one another one of Sharon, Gary, or was that it? Okay, all right, we uh, got one of Sharon in the last program. All right, now before we go on into our verse by verse, and I am going to get there now, before the afternoon is off, we're going to go into James verse by verse, but before we do, I want to make another timeline explanation so that you get a clear picture like I said in the very first program, in our introduction to James, which was now six programs back, that <clears throat> not only were these little Jewish epistles written to Jews who thought the tribulation was coming right down the pipe in their lifetime, but it is also appropriate for the Jews who will be living when the tribulation yet comes, which is, of course, we think near in the future. So, in order to explain the opening up of the timeline, I'm just going to briefly again look at where the Scripture delineates the Apostle Paul as the Apostle of the Gentiles. So, turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 9. And after his conversion on the road to Damascus, before he even gets his sight back, God speaks to a believing Jew in Damascus and gives him this tremendous bit of information. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Now this is a complete departure from everything that has been going on. Because as we've always taught, all the way up through the Old Testament economy, especially from the call of Abraham, God pulled off of the mainstream of humanity from the offspring of Adam, one man, and through that, one man brought about the nation of Israel, or what we call the Jewish people. All right, so that's my, my flow up here. 
Now we're going to see that after Israel has rejected the Messiah and they reject Peter and the eleven in their preaching, the day will come when they will be dispersed once again back into the whole river of humanity, which of course culminated or began with the invasion of Titus in 70 AD. Now then, prior to that, about 30 years, in 40 AD, when we have this uh, conversion of Saul of Tarsus, we have another group of people pulled off the mainstream of humanity, and it's the church, the body of Christ, the Gentile believer. All right, now let's just look at that briefly before we go back and look at James. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. <clears throat> but the Lord said unto him, that is, unto Ananias, Go thy way, for he, Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles. Now, I always have to stop and qualify. What did the average Jew, the average man in the street, think of Gentiles? Oh, they were the pits, and they were. They were pagan, they were idolaters, they had no morality, and so the Jews never had anything to do with the Gentiles. In fact, whenever I get on this, I always have to think of Jonah. Jonah was the perfect example of a good, godly Jew. And when the Lord told Jonah to go to Nineveh, that pagan Gentile city, what did Jonah do? Well, he went the opposite direction. Instead of going east across the desert, he gets on ship and he's out on the Mediterranean, see? In other words, and I've always put it this way, just as for the sake of keeping people awake, Jonah was such a good Jew that he'd rather walk the plank out there in the middle of the Mediterranean as go to a Gentile city. Well, that was their mentality. They were to have nothing to do with Gentiles unless God made the exception as he did. All right, so when the Lord reveals to this good Jew, Saul, that he's going to send him to the Gentiles, I want you to realize that must have been a shock supreme. Me, a good Jew, go to those pagan Gentiles? That's where you're going, Saul. And I'm going to call out a people for my name. All right, so we'll finish the verse, and then I'll take the verse where I just picked that from. So he said, he will bear my name before the Gentiles and kings, and of course, the children of Israel. We're not going to leave the Jew out of the picture. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. All right, so that was the beginning then of God turning toward the Gentile races of people and beginning to let Israel slip through the cracks. All right, now years later, of course, after about uh, 12 years, in about A.D. 52, Paul has now been out there ministering among the Gentiles, especially up in Asia Minor, and as he would establish these little Gentile congregations based on his gospel of grace, not of works, but by faith plus nothing, the Judaizers from the Jerusalem church would come in behind and begin to cast doubt on that and say, well, you can't be saved by faith alone. You have to keep the law. You have to practice circumcision. So they had this council in Jerusalem in about 52 A.D. where Paul and Barnabas go up to Jerusalem and confront the twelve about this problem. And... Uh, as I shared with Laura, I had one young lady, I couldn't imagine that she had this kind of insight because she's only been a believer out of a, out of a religion for the last six, seven months. And she asked the question, she said, weren't the twelve getting awful close <laughs> to the anathema that Paul spoke of in Galatians 1, that if any preach any other gospel than what I... And you know, I've often thought of that. Yes, they were close because they were promoting it, evidently. They said they didn't command it, but they certainly didn't forbid it. And so that's why Paul and Barnabas go up to Jerusalem and confront the Twelve over this question. All right, now the reason I'm rehearsing all that is because I'm taking you now to Acts chapter 15, and at the culmination of this Jerusalem council now, in around 51 or 52 A.D., when Peter, James, and John finally agree and make a gentleman's agreement with the Apostle Paul 
that they would confine their ministry to Israel and they would quit sticking their nose in Paul's dealing with the Gentiles. And Paul and Barnabas could go to the Gentile. That was a gentleman's agreement. All right, now then, here's where James, of the James and Peter and John that writes in the back of our Bible, this is the statement that James makes at the end of this consul in Jerusalem. Starting in verse 13. Acts 15, verse 13. And after they had held their peace, in other words, the argument finally was settled and everything quieted down. And so after they had held their peace, James, not Peter, James, who is the moderator of this, of this Jerusalem uh, council. And after they had held their peace, James answered saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon, or Peter, has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now, what's he referring to? The house of Cornelius. When Peter was forced by the miraculous power of God to go to that Gentile Roman household, and he saw the proof that God was now saving Gentiles, even those pagan Romans, see? All right, and so James says, this is the conclusion, that at the first he did visit the Gentiles to take out of them, out of the Gentiles, a people for his name. And then look at verse 16. After this, after what? The calling out of the church, the body of Christ. After this, the calling out a people from amongst the Gentile, I will return and build again the tabernacle of David. In other words, God will pick up where he left off with the nation of Israel. All right, so that's why now I go to a second timeline to clarify this Old Testament timeline is going to be interrupted and God is going to call out a people for his name, beginning with the Apostle Paul there in about 40 A.D. And so now, I haven't done this before on the program, so now this separated nation of Israel that was above the flow of humanity is now going to be funneled back in in what we call the dispersion, and they're going to be scattered amongst all the Gentiles of the world, and at the previous 30 years, 40 A.D., God begins calling out another group of people, the Gentiles, or what we call the body of Christ. Now, here's where people get confused when I talk about two Gospels. Well, it stands to reason, while you're in that transition period, in almost 30 years, that you have Peter and the eleven still preaching to the nation of Israel that Jesus was the Christ, or what we call the gospel of the kingdom. But before that has finished, God has already set the apostle Paul aside and sent him out with that revealed mystery, the gospel of grace. So the two are operating for a little while, uh, contemporary with one another. Peter and the eleven are still preaching the gospel of the kingdom to the Jews. Paul has now begun to preach the gospel of grace to the Gentile. That stands to reason. That's a Gentile, I mean, a, a transitional phenomenon. But once Israel has finally fallen through the cracks and God has finished dealing with them, and he's going only now with Paul and his gospel, then yes, there's one gospel. There's one gospel. For Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich and poor, there is only one plan of salvation today. Now, of course, we know, as we saw a little bit in the last program, that when the Gentile body of Christ is finally filled and we think we're getting real close, it's not going to go back into the human race. It's going to be taken out, going to be caught up in what we call Paul's teaching of the rapture. And then 
then God will bring Israel back into the scene, as we've already seen. She has now appeared since 1948. She's been amongst the family of nations. And so once again now, after the rapture is over, the world is going to be faced with this seven years. You can't cast it aside because it's prophesied. And so this seven years is still out in the future. As soon as this body of Christ out of the Gentile world, and it can also include some Jews. We're not going to leave them out. There are not many, but there can be. And so once that body of Christ is removed and raptured out, then will come the wrath and vexation that has been promised ever since the Old Testament prophets. And then Christ will yet return and yet set up the kingdom. Now, the reason I've done all this is, as these Jews who have been out here in the dispersion now for almost 2,000 years, as they come back and establish the homeland, and they are being prepared for these end time events that were originally intended to come here, you're going to have the same scenario that you had back here. So what does that mean? That means that these little Jewish epistles are just as appropriate for Jews who will be facing and going into this horrible seven-year period now as it would have been back there. Now, does that make sense? Am I making it plain? So yes, you remember in my very first program here six weeks back, I said that yes, these little epistles are not just for the Jews of the day that the scriptures were written, but it would also be for Jews as they're approaching the end time tribulation as we still see it. So hopefully, hopefully that'll clarify it, and that's why I told you. I'm not putting it at one end or the other, I'm putting it at both. It was appropriate for the Jews of Peter's day because they thought this was all coming. Now, the question came up at break time. I probably didn't make it clear. Was Peter looking for the rapture of the second coming? Well, the second coming. Peter didn't have, a, I don't think, a foggy notion of the rapture, and I got a reason for that. Now, before we start, James, I'll let you look at that one. Second Peter, we've used it over and over through the years, but let's look at it again, and then we're going to come back to James. Second Peter, chapter 3. Verse 15, now you remember a couple programs back, I put it on the board, that 2 Peter was written at the end of Peter's life, about 68 A.D., and almost within, I think, a month of Paul's writing his last letter, 2 Timothy. And both men spoke of their martyrdom. They both realize now that they're not going to continue on and they're not going to see the return of Christ, but that they will be martyred. All right, so before Peter loses his life, and as he writes the second letter, verse 15 of chapter 3, a verse I've used many, many times to show how that even Peter now recognizes that Paul is now the man of the hour. It's Paul's epistles where the human race has to go. All right, verse 15, he says, Account or understand that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Always has been. God has always been concerned about the salvation of lost humanity. All right, now then he reads on. Even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, now that has to be the revelation of the mysteries, even as our beloved brother Paul, who has been given the revelation of the mysteries, according to the wisdom given unto him, has, past tense, see? It's all done. Has written unto you, now verse 16, as also in all his epistles, which makes me think that 2 Timothy is either just written or Paul is now in the process, the Holy Spirit knew. But anyway, as Peter writes by inspiration, as also in all his epistles, 
speaking in them of these things, that is, things pertaining to the salvation of the whole human race, but in which, now this is amazing, here's old Peter at the end of his life, having been a contemporary now of the Apostle Paul for some 25 years, and yet he says, in which are some things hard to be understood. Now, when people write and tell me that, you know, I'm, I'm saying things that they've never heard before, and they find kind of hard to swallow, I can understand that. Here's dear old Peter, went with the Lord for three years and preached for umpteen, and yet after 25 years, he couldn't comprehend what Paul had written. It was beyond him. All right, so he says, in which are some things hard to be understood, and which they who are unlearned, that is, in the Scriptures, and unstable, twist, as they do also the other Scriptures. And if you want to know what's going to happen to false teachers, here it is. It's to their own destruction, their eternal doom. All right, so now then we have established that after the church age is finished and the body of Christ is raptured out, then the tribulation is still facing the whole human race and Israel in particular. All right, so now then let's come back and we'll start looking at the little letter of James. James chapter 1, verse 1. James. Now I think I qualified it in an earlier program. This is not the original James of the Twelve. He's been beheaded sometime before. So this must be the half-brother of Jesus, a son of Joseph and Mary. All right, so James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to, now watch this, my, I guess if I've taught anything over the year is, you watch who is a portion of Scripture written to. It's tantamount to understanding it. All right, and he says he's writing to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Now you want to remember that Israel has already been dispersed way back in 606 BC, between that and 550 with the Babylonian captivity. And after the Babylonian captivity, only a few thousand Jews came back to Jerusalem in order to get ready for Christ's first advent. So what happened to the rest of them? Well, they were scattered throughout the whole then known world. Well, then you see it's going to be compounded a few years after all of this has taken place with the next big dispersion, which is the destruction by Titus. But when James is writing about Jews dispersed, I think the primary reason was the horrible persecution of Saul of Tarsus. Now then, let's go back to the book of Acts and pick this up a minute. How that? Those Jews of Christ's day who had embraced him as the Messiah, the promised Redeemer of Israel, were persecuted to no end by this religious Pharisee, Saul of Tarsus. All right, so as you come back then to Acts, so we pick up who these Jews are that James is writing to, come all the way back to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Stephen has just been stoned in chapter 7. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, honey. <clears throat> Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Now, so I don't lose you or my television audience, remember what are we establishing? Who are these scattered Jews to whom James is writing? Well, they were Jewish believers of the kingdom gospel that Jesus was the Christ, but they had been ravaged by the persecution of Saul of Tarsus. All right, verse 1 of chapter 8, Saul, the one who becomes the apostle Paul, Saul was consenting unto his, Stephen's, death. Now here it is. At that time there was a great persecution 
against the church or the assembly which was at Jerusalem. Well, who was that assembly at Jerusalem? Believing Jews, see? Believing Jews who had come out of Christ's earthly ministry and others, you remember, on the day of Pentecost, how many were added? 3,000. And many others continued. So that Jerusalem congregation of believing Jews that Jesus was the Christ was a goodly number. But old Saul came in there, and as he said himself in Galatians 1, he what? He wasted it. He destroyed it. And how did he destroy it? By causing them to scatter like a bunch of quail. All right, so here it is. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, the Jewish church. And they were all, what's the next word? Scattered. They were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. That's north of Jerusalem. But I always make the point, who refused to leave except the apostles? Now, these people that hang on that Great Commission, I always ask them, why in the world didn't the Twelve go out and keep the Great Commission? Well, then they can't answer. Well, they couldn't until they had the king and the kingdom. See, Israel couldn't be an evangelist to the Gentiles. They had to have first the king and the kingdom, and then, yes, they would be able to. But as of yet, that hasn't happened. So these Jewish believers now gathered there in the church of Jerusalem are scattered throughout the then known world and because of Saul's persecution. Now, if I have a minute or so, we can go look at one more in Acts chapter 11. I got one minute, so we got to do this quickly. Acts chapter 11 and drop down to verse 19. And if there's one verse that opened up this whole scenario to my understanding, this is it. Acts 11, verse 19. All got it? Now they who were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose around Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch, but preaching the word to none but Jew only. See how plain that is? They weren't scattering to go out and take that the gospel was for the Gentile. No. All they understood was that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah. And as a result of Saul's persecution, they are now going out and that's what they're proclaiming to other Jews, that that Jesus of Nazareth was the promised Messiah. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.